themselves educators, junior high, high school, higher ed, something along those lines. Okay, awesome. Yes, big on memorization. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, who would consider themselves students? And hopefully everybody's raising their hand because everybody should be a lifelong learner, right? <laughs> so let's go ahead and get started. So as you can see, the, um, the title for my presentation is Teach for Understanding, Not Memorization. Mm -hmm. There's definitely a difference between the two. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Tasha Pidwell. I'm a, a certified solutions architect associate level. I'm also an AWS educator, a restart instructor, an AWS academy instructor, an AWS educate instructor and cloud ambassador, mm -hmm. and a women tech make, uh, women's tech maker ambassador, which is a Google thing, but that's fine. <laughs> um, now, a couple of things to note um, that are on the far your right hand side, you can see some of the uh, schools that I taught at in the past or am currently teaching at. One thing to note about me is I am hearing impaired. So I don't necessarily, hearing is not my strength. I wear hearing aids, but you know, sometimes pitches, tones, echoes, all of those things come into play. So what I would like to do is I feel it feels like I'm having trouble understanding anybody. That's my cell phone number. Text me your question, and that might be the easiest way to, and you can use that after our session is to, uh, over today as well, if you have any questions. Um, so rules for my classroom. So I showed you a list of some schools that I teach at, and one of them is you got to communicate with me. I was a non-traditional student. I was in, um, I was 28 when I finally finished my associate's degree. I did that working multiple jobs and being a single mom. So I understand if you are in a similar, you know, um, if you're in a similar situation that, you know, you may be struggling having the similar, similar struggles as I was balancing time and commitments. And you got to communicate with me. If something's going on, just tell me what's going on and then we'll work around it. But that being said, you have to do the work. Um, you can't get around that. Communication, you have something going on, communicate with me, but that's not an excuse to not do the work. Because ultimately, I will not work harder for your education than you do. And this is something, first day of class, I tell my students, basically, you have to do the work. There's no um, magical wand, there's no fairy dust, there's none of that stuff that I can do for you. If you don't do it, then I can't help you. Um, so, and education is for understanding. It's not to regurgitate, it's not for memorization, it is for understanding. And this actually, I was probably in my 30s before I actually kind of realized this, um, personal experiences. Um, I was, when growing up, I was considered the smart kid. I didn't really need to study. Your mic is not working. What's wrong with that? It's not working. Oh. Thank you. Okay. How's that? <laughs> Big difference. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so I was like the smart one. I didn't need to study, you know, did well in school. Um, so I didn't really develop good study habits whenever I was growing up. And, you know, when you're growing up, that's awesome. I don't need to study and I do well. But when you're actually an adult, it's like, oh, this is hard. Um, so I learned in my 30s how to learn for understanding and not just to memorize it because there is a huge difference, which is why um, whenever I see students struggling, I just reinforce this, you need to learn to understand, and you're learning how to learn when you're in my classroom. And that is such a big thing that I don't think some students understand that there's a concept that they need to learn how to learn in your classroom. And so when they go in the workforce, they're more um, better prepared. So my experience teaching AWS, um, it started with AWS Educate. Show of hands, who's familiar with AWS Educate? Okay, I see one. Okay. What about AWS Academy? Okay. And what about AWS Restart? Okay. 
So I'm going to start with AWS um, Educate. I do have some links in here. You guys will get the slides. And I'm not necessarily going through every individual link just for the sake of time. But after we're done, if there's any Q&A, we can definitely go back. So AWS Educate is the platform AWS created to teach junior high, high school level, and higher ed as well. So um, it previously was only available if you had a .edu email account. So basically, if you're an educator or a student, you had access to it. But that's changed over the past year or so. And it's now available to anybody. Um, there is no credit card required. And you know, obviously, if you're 13, you know, 13 year olds probably not going to have a credit card available to them. And mom and dad may not really trust giving them a credit card to you know, explore AWS. So that's one of the benefits if you know, somebody's around junior high level and they're want, curious about AWS or if you want to teach them about AWS, it's a really great platform. It includes modules and labs, and it's very tailored based off interest, whether just a basic level or if they're interested in something like machine learning and deep racer, um, gaming, whatever they have an interest in, there's a great way to tailor to the interests of the students. And once you tailor to the interests of the students, um, you can see that light just kind of click, you know, that they're interested and they're engaged and they want to learn because they want to learn as opposed to they're just doing going through the motions to because they have to. <coughs> um, so there's a little screenshot from AWS Educate. Again, there's a link and we can go back and, you know, we'll see how time is at the end of our day and explore some of those resources. But you guys will have the slides um, with the links when they send them out. So some of the benefits of AWS Educate is it's simple and barrier free. Like I said, there's no credit card needed. Um, you gain access to hands on labs to the console and it's content designed for beginners. So very basic level. They have no um, experience working with anything technology or understanding the capital expenditures and the cost savings. This is designed for them. And connection to employment. Now there is a job board associated with it. Um, I don't know how well it's aligned with beginners, um, like internships, but there is a job board if they're just curious to see what the job opportunities are out there. Okay. AWS Academy, I think there was a few more hands that were raised for AWS Academy. AWS Academy, well, the, I used to work at Hawking College, um, and the backstory of how I actually learned about AWS in 2018, I came to Hawking College as a computer science program manager, trying to find resources to help build a better program. And I read about a school in New Mexico as a community college who started using cloud computing in their education. So I actually reached out to AWS and Google um, to see, you know, what kind of resources were available for community colleges. AWS is the one that got back with me first, and that's the only reason I hopped on the AWS train wagon and I've never left. Uh, but AWS Academy um, is available through approved institutions. The resources are at no cost to the institutions. You do have to have an approved educator to teach them. So that is the caveat to say, you know, there's no cost for the resources, but you got to pay for the educator. No, again, no credit card is required for the students. So even though these are higher ed, college level or adults, that's still a barrier. For some of them, like whenever the whole idea of putting a credit card number in, they're just like, no. So no credit card is required for the students, which helps remove that barrier. And again, there's modules and labs, and there's a sandbox, which gives them more room to play in a very controlled environment where they don't have to worry about accruing um, the cost. Do you, do you know? Do you have to have like a, a college domain email? No, but you usually in the institutions I've taught, you have to pay them, and then um, once you're registered in that class, then your the instructor will add you to the class. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a non-credit unless the institution has it for credit in some way. However, they got it set up. But basically, you say, hey, you know, for example, Hawking College, I want to enroll in this particular class. It's like, okay, you pay X amount of dollars, and then the instructor will enroll you in the class. Okay. 
Some of the benefits to AWS Academy, um, so you can become, a, for institutions, become a leader in cloud education. In 2019-2020, I think is whenever AW, um, Hawking College became an AWS Academy partner um, institution. And at that time, if you look at the list of AWS Academy institutions in the state of Ohio, I think we were one of two. So that was pretty cool that we were, you know, kind of that early. There's more now. Um, but, you know, there's a list of institutions that can have that kind of accreditation. And for an institution, they're able to develop and retain educators, you know, which, you know, institutions need. For educators, they have access to cloud courses. Um, they can receive complimentary AWS professional training, which, you know, has, has been nice and helpful. And they can also receive discounts on AWS certifications exams. Students, they get to be able to land a well-paid job in one of the fastest growing industries and gain skills. And again, they also get a certificate um, discount. And employers, they can just come close those cloud skill gaps that we all know exist right now. AWS Restart. So the thing about AWS Academy, I didn't mention, there's an expectation that you have some basic skills, whether it be business or tech, like very minimum, but you need to know like what an IP address is. You need to know, have some idea how networks work. Don't need in-depth knowledge, but you need like basic, basic um, level of understanding with AWS Academy. And that uh, AWS Academy can be taught in as few as two weeks, not recommended, but it can be taught in as few as two weeks if it's full time. AWS Restart. AWS Restart is a full time classroom based skills developed and training program. So what that means is I think it for if you were doing around 30 40 hours a week in the classroom full time, you can complete it in 12 weeks. The one I'm currently teaching is at half time and it's about 24 weeks is for the length of the program. Now what's different about restart from academy is it teach if you have no background in technology, this will teach you. Okay, it's the very, very basics It teaches you about Linux. It teaches you about what a network is. It teaches you about IP addresses. It, te it teaches you about CIDR notations. It teaches all that very, very basic stuff. And when I first started teaching Restart, I wasn't fully, I got access to the course about a half hour before my first day of class. So I'm like, okay, haven't had much time to preview, but that's okay, we'll, we'll make do. Um, so once I actually started, you know, understanding it and seeing what the curriculum was about, I was kind of thinking it was going to be AWS Academy where everything is about AWS. It's about VPCs, about, it's about their storage, it's about their databases, everything with AWS Academy is AWS. That's not the case with Restart. So whenever they were doing a long focus on Linux, I'm like, why are we talking about Linux? <laughs> why are we not going straight into the VPCs? And then once I realized what it was doing is trying to lay the groundwork because not the expectation is not everybody has, you know, IT skills or background in it. And it was fun. I mean, I haven't done anything with Linux since I was an undergrad. So I was kind of like, you know, doing a fast refresher myself and kind of relearning the stuff, you know, with the students, but it was fun. And I shared that with the students. And the, the purpose of me sharing that with the students is to kind of help them feel more comfortable with imposter syndrome. Does everybody know what imposter syndrome is? Okay. So, you know, help them feel more comfortable with the things that they weren't familiar with. And it helps prepare them for you know careers in the cloud. It connects them to potential employers. Now, just like I said earlier that I will not work harder for your education than you do, connecting them to potential employers, I also expect the students to put their own legwork in. Ask them to have a LinkedIn account. It's like who's got a LinkedIn account? Some yes, some no. If they had a yes, it's like how active are you on it? And usually most of them are no. Okay. So you need to get active on LinkedIn and there's no if and buts about it. If you just you just need to be active on LinkedIn, if this is the career that you want to do. And some grumble about it, but it's the reality of it. <laughs> uh, technology background is not required uh, and the program is focused on unemployed or underemployed individuals. 
Now, when I first heard about Restart, I thought it was more for um, people re-entering into society, like they maybe they were incarcerated or they're you know been in recovery from drug and alcohol rehabilitation. But that wasn't the case. It was basically for anybody who's on or underemployed and wants to start a career. Now, the Restart program is no cost to the students, but you have to be approved. Again, I said earlier, it's like it's a very more time intensive course. It's you know 12 weeks if it's full time, 24 weeks if it's half time. So you have to make that commitment. Uh, but it is free. It can build skills aligned to AWS certification and you can connect with employers and start your career. And then again, I go back to you need to be active on LinkedIn. I tell students you need to be active on LinkedIn and you, you need to attend meetups and you need to attend conferences. You know, not all conferences cost money. This one I think was what, 20 bucks? Uh -huh. um, some conferences are with AWS are, you know, a lot more than that. <laughs> But you can find the free ones or meetups. Meetups are usually no cost and they usually have pretty good food if you're able to attend one in person. So, you know, attend those. But again, you have to do the work. So again, I know we're about AWS, but I love Steve Jobs. Every time I tell my husband that I have to do, uh, that I get the um, either doing a presentation or have a new teaching position about AWS or something with Apple, He's thrilled because that means I have somebody else to talk to about AWS or um, Steve Jobs other than him because he gets tired of hearing about it. But any Steve Jobs fans in here? Sure. Okay. <laughs> so it gave a tremendous level of self confidence that through exploration and learning, one could understand seemingly very complex things in one's environment. When you first start learning about AWS, it is complex. It's overwhelming, right? Um, I used to work for a medical college and a physician told me going to medical school was trying to drink from a water hose um, or from a fire hose. Yeah. What this, is, this job is harder than being a doctor. <laughs> and at least the body pretty much stays the same as opposed to anything that comes. So itself is frustrating trying to stay on top with it when it changes, uh, like the weather in Ohio. Um, but, you know, trying to learn anything new can be very daunting. And AWS is no different than that. But what's nice is when, whenever somebody says they don't know how to do something, it's like, well, nobody knows how to do it until they learn. You know, that's the whole point of you coming here. Uh, but again, you got to do the work. So the curriculum, it kind of varies a little bit depending on the educate, uh, the academy or the restart. But most of them are pretty much comprised of short modules created by solutions architect cloud engineers from AWS. They have labs and there's knowledge checks. The things that I add um, is the documentation scavenger hunt. If I had to change um, two things on there on the way AWS you know, does their curriculum is have more focus on the documentation. There's not a lot of focus on the documentation. They give you modules, they give you some slides, but they don't make you look at the documentation. Because um, learning how to navigate and find answers in documentation is a skill in itself. <laughs> um, and knowing how to do that is going to help them better prepare to learn how to learn so that they can find their own solutions instead of calling on the teacher or you know whatever resource. But the documentation can be a little daunting itself, whether you have the HTML or the PDF format. I prefer the HTML format. Does anybody prefer the HTML over PDF? Uh, what, does who prefers the PDF of thousands of pages long? <laughs> okay. Um, what is it? I like PDFs because they're more, yes, affordable yeah. to have yeah, well, there, there are some there are some benefits to it. I just usually find it daunting when I open up a PDF and says hundreds or thousands of pages. Like that's a lot. Yeah. Might be a few <laughs> so whenever we're learning about a particular subject, like you know whether it be VPCs or S3, I have them go to the link for the documentation and just like the very basics, usually like the about or the abstract or just like the very introduction and have them, you know, have some questions like, 
find the answer here in this documentation page. And that helps them, you know, get more comfortable with it. Kahoot, who's familiar with Kahoot? Is he one, couple, a few? Okay, awesome. So Kahoot, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a way to gamify education and it keeps things engaging in the classroom. So especially I teach online right now and if you, you know, online classes, they're kind of like soul sucking if, you know, nobody wants to engage. <laughs> but Kahoot makes that a little bit better. So you can do it as a game um, or I've been also been doing it as a study guide. So if I'm doing it as a game, I usually limit it to 10 or 15 questions. It's competition. You, if, again, if you're not familiar with it, there's a time you answer the questions. It's usually multiple choice and whatnot. Now you can do it as a study guide where you assign it and students like using that as a study guide. Now I usually do 50 to 70 questions on a study guide. And there's also guided notes. So you can see some links in here when you get the when you get the slides, you can click on the links and if we can go back if we have time during the Q&A. Um, but there's guided notes. So guided notes are something that I started doing for students, again, because you're learning a lot of new content. And let me actually let me go ahead and open that one up. It's easier to explain that one if it'll let me. Eh, we'll do it later. Just, but basically, um, uh, so basically, there's there's three or four sections of a guided notes. There are some are just terminology. Like you're learning some new terminology today, go ahead and you know write out the definitions and the things that your takeaways from the terminology. Um, some of them are you know kind of fill in the blank, and then some of them are schematics. Draw it out. Um, another thing that I wish the AWS curriculum did um, include it more for as instruction to the students is to draw out the schematics because the cloud is intangible, right? You can't really touch it, you know? So drawing out the schematics when you're learning about VPCs and availability zones and subnets and, you know, all of that stuff. And especially when you get more intricate, um, more detailed with like the internet gateway, the NAT gateway, things of that nature, it can be it helps with the retention and understanding when they draw out the schematic. It doesn't have to be pretty, just draw it out, see how it all relates to each, uh, to each other. And that's going to help you with the terminology as well and understanding how all those things relate. And then they also, it's recommended they have an AWS account. Um, depending on what kind of curriculum we're on, um, they may not have access to a lab or a full breadth of um, lab resources that um, they can actually explore and play with a little bit. Because even if you do have a lab through like AWS Educate or AWS Academy, there are some restrictions on like I am. There's some things that you cannot do that you just need to have access to an AWS account. So putting it together, um, there's a couple of different ways that I put this together whenever I present it to my students and I teach a class. So here's one version. I created Kahoot based on the modules and the slides. There's usually 30 to 70 questions. And again, this is something that I create. This takes probably about for every class, it's about two or three hours of prep work for me to make these questions, to read the slides, prepare, make the questions. But the beauty of it is like they're easy to be reused for the next class. <laughs> They are a sign and it's not a competition. Um, I do have the, the paid version of Kahoot, so I don't know what's free and what's the paid version, but you can assign them so the students can still go through the process, uh, you know, doing the games and it's just at their own, you know, on their, on their own pace. And they really like it. Like even when I do a game, you know, and I don't make it as an assignment, they ask if I can make an assignment so they can do it on their own. And what I've noticed is whenever I started doing these cahoots and these guided notes, um, that whenever we do the review of the questions in class, okay, but uh, number two first, um, review the questions in class that students perform the worst on. So with Kahoot, you can see the statistics of how well students did, but the questions that they you know, had more and more trouble with, then we'll go over those in more detail. 
If there were questions and concepts that you know all the students did pretty well on, we're not going to cover those. Um, because there's one thing I hate worse as a teacher is reading slides. <laughs> I hate being read to. I hate, you know, if I was a student and students don't like it, I hate doing it as a teacher, as reading slides. Because what tends to happen is like, do you guys all read a slide? Does anybody have any questions on this? It's usually crickets. You know, it's like nobody has any questions on anything. It is the most soul sucking experience as a teacher. Um, but if they doing poorly on these, it's like, okay, you guys don't got this. Let's go ahead and review it and discuss and have conversations about it. And sometimes because again, I do all of these from scratch from like, you know, reading the slides and creating it. It maybe might be the way I said it, maybe I, the way I phrased the question they didn't understand or the way they interpret it was different than what I intended. That's a conversation we're having, and that's going to help not only that particular student, but everybody else have a better understanding of the concepts that we're discussing. It helps me as a teacher, it's like, okay, if I didn't express this the right way, then I need to know that for next time. Um, and then, like I said, we'll just re-review the slides and the resources, there's more conversation, and it's a more engaging online classroom environment. If there's a lab, they complete the lab. Not all modules have a lab associated with it. So what I try to do um, as time allows is I try to find like a tutorial or a basic how-to that's found on AWS, all the resources they have, so they know how to find them. And then they use the free lab that they have access to, you know, through whatever their program is. Now, I usually try to test it first because, like I said, with the sandbox environment, with the restart or the academy or the educate, there are some limitations. So I try to test it to make sure it can be successfully completed or let them know. It's like, we'll get to this point and then it won't work anymore because it's a lab. But they get to have that experience. And then we're going to complete the knowledge checks. Um, what I've noticed and what the students have told me since we start doing the Kahoot in the guided notes, um, if you're not familiar with the knowledge checks, they're basically five to 10 questions at the end of a section. And it's, um, you can take as many times as you need to to get 80% correct. What students have told me is like after doing the Kahoot in the guided notes that they're able to pass um, usually at 100% of the knowledge checks the first time, which is really like the whole point of that. That tells me that, you know, doing it that way is working as opposed to me reading slides and nobody having questions, but learning that nobody knows, under, nobody understands anything yet. <laughs> and then we read the documentation on the subject um, as relevant and at the level for what they're studying on right now. The other thing we do is uh, review case studies. So AWS has a whole website devoted to customer stories or case studies, whichever one you want to call it. So whenever we're learning about something, um, there's a way that you can filter it down based off um, the kind of technology. Maybe you're wanting to learn about S3. You can filter down to all the case studies uh, of companies using S3. And um, I, it's not, it's dependent upon the class, sometimes I let them choose whichever kind of industry they have an interest in. Gaming is usually a popular example. Find gaming companies that are using S3 and see what they do. Okay, it's given like a real life scenario of how they're using S3 storage. If my class is a little less than motivated to find their own, you know, area of interest, I give them an assignment. It just, again, it kind of depends upon the class. And another way that I do this, um, if I don't do the cahoots um, as a study guide, I create my own guided notes. So I mentioned earlier, there's terminology, draw it out, fill in the blank, open ended questions. I do do a cahoot as a review at the end, but it's only 10 to 20 questions if I do the guided notes because there's only 24 hours in the day. <laughs> and when you're creating this from scratch, it takes time. Um, then again, everything else is pretty much the same. Review the questions. I can see how well the students perform, complete the lab, complete the knowledge checks, review the documentation, and review case studies. So with the documentation, what we usually do with the documentation is we do scavenger hunts. I mentioned scavenger hunts earlier. 
Basically, I have a question and, you know, I look, make sure it's, it's um, stated plainly within the documentation. It's more or less kind of fill in the blank, but they have to go through the action of reading it and finding the answer and um, to get them more comfortable with doing it. Um, I use guided notes. I make guided notes and then have them find the answers in the documentation. And then they're seeing the terminology being used in context. Okay, so sometimes just the terminology is getting comfortable with the terminology is a skill in itself. And then they increase their comfort level navigating the documentation. Again, whether you have a preference for PDF or HTML, they kind of figure out what they like at this learning stage. So whenever they're in their next stage, actually be you know, working for a company, they have more um, increased comfort level of just know, knowing how to find the answer to a solution instead of being overwhelmed by all of that that's in there. Case studies, so again, they can see real life um, scenarios of how companies are using AWS and maybe um, like how they either are taking advantage of an opportunity or you know, we're solving a problem. So whenever there's a case study, whenever we use case studies, the students have to do like maybe a two minute presentation. Um, what the company was that they you know, learned about, um, what was the problem that the company had? Was it storage? Was it, you know, things need to be updated? Was it a database issue? Whatever the problem was. What solutions did they use? Did they use S3 storage? Um, and what was the outcome? Were the cost savings? Was it, you know, more efficient? Was it faster? Whatever. So they're seeing it in real life scenario of how a company is doing it and the outcome from it. And just to kind of copy up on the, to follow up on the whole LinkedIn thing, I encourage the students, find that company or that person or to give you a name of an individual, you know, find them on LinkedIn, follow them, connect with them, you know, send them a message, like, you know, visit a person, it's like, hey, I read about how your company did X, Y, Z, but using AWS, thought it was really cool. And I'm looking to learn more about AWS, okay? It doesn't have to be an ask for something. You're just like making that connection. You're building your network early on. Um, so some principles and learning. Um, let's see. So learners use what they already know to construct new understanding. So whenever we do case studies, I try to let them, if they already have an interest in something, if they already know gaming and all that's involved with the gaming, that's going to help them have a better understanding of how things work within a gaming system. Learners have different strategies, approaches, patterns of abilities, and learning styles. I think everybody knows that. Everybody has their own particular learning style. Um, their motivation to learn and sense of self affects what is learned, how much is learned, and how much effort they will be put into the learning processes. And the practices and activities in which people engage while learning shape what is learned and it's enhanced through socially supported interaction. So we use um, platforms like Slack and Discord to communicate with each other and to share, um, you know, just to share. Um, so the message I give to students like you will fail. We talked about failing, um, failures and a couple of other, like I think the keynote addressed it. And there, I know it's in some other presentations where they talked about you will fail. And that is okay. I just want to make sure my alarm doesn't go off. Uh, so I tell the students, you know, have my three things in the beginning, and then I also say, oh, by the way, you're going to fail. Um, and, and just accept it. The, and what failing means is labs will not always work. You will have to reread the documentation several times over. You are going to have to search the unfamiliar um, terminology. If they use terms that you're not familiar with, guess what? Google's your best friend. Um, you know, you'll find it. But fail is the first attempt in learning. I heard that at a conference I don't know, a couple of years ago. I'm like, that's awesome. I'm using it whenever <laughs> I present. <laughs> and it's okay to fail. And I know I've done some labs with AWS where I'm like, going, when I first started learning about AWS, it's like, okay, it says to click this button and this button and this button and this button. It's like, Sam. I was like, that's awesome. I have no idea what I did, but that's awesome. <laughs> But when things, uh, when I break things, I'm like, oh, crap. Um, now I have to figure things out. 
And as you may know, documentation does not always keep up to pace with the console. And sometimes that is a learning curve in itself. It's like, just accept it and embrace it and know that you're going to learn from it. So AWS also has some additional resources. Again, these are links when you'll get the PowerPoint. Um, provides multiple resources at no charge. There's webinars, like there's a whole page devoted to AWS webinars that you can attend. And then there's AWS Skill Builder. Who's familiar with Skill Builder? I uh, want a couple. Okay. So with Skill Builder, it, um, it's free. The way you log in is, does everybody have an Amazon.com account? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can log in use your, using your Amazon.com credentials. It doesn't have to be Prime, but if you've ever bought anything on Amazon before, in which I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption, the answer is yes. Um, you can log in with those credentials. And there's a great resources for you to learning from the basic fundamentals to more advanced. You do not need to rely on outside purchases. Um, and it's just a matter of finding the right resources for you and making the most out of them. And um, the, I'm on pretty much all the social media platforms, but those are the ones you're gonna find me actually being active on. Um, so feel free to find me and connect with me on those and you have my phone number. <laughs> feel free to text me. You can try calling, but no guarantees I'll answer or be nice if I answer. If 